Right. Okay. All right. Hey, what's up, Warriors? Jeff Anderson here, Executive Director of WarriorLife.com and the Warrior Life Academy. And welcome to podcast episode number 424. Now, if you're as old as I am, you may just remember having to take part in like those duck and cover drills in school back in the 50s, 60s, and even the early 70s. By the way, I was not back there in the 50s and 60s, but uh, definitely in the 70s. And I remember that this was a this was a civil action drill that was put in place after the Soviet Union tested its first nuclear detonation back in 1949. And suddenly we realized that we weren't the only nuclear power in the world back then. And so a lot of us kids remember um, the Cold War days and that nuclear arms race um, in a very real way. And it, it it did affect us even in schools, being able to get underneath our desk to make sure that if there was a nuclear detonation near us, if there was a nuclear attack, that we were going to be safe. And, you know, a lot of the kids these days don't remember the Cold War and are jogging for, for position in that arms race, largely because of the fall of the Soviet Union. But the visions of a nuclear wasteland are back in our heads now as the unthinkable of a nuclear warhead exchange with Russia has all come back into the news recently. Now, to bring you up to speed, if you haven't been paying attention at all, last week, Biden declared that we are closer to nuclear Armageddon than we've been in 60 years. Now, I know he's caught a lot of flack for this, and it was pretty reckless, to say the least, to even mention it as the leader of a nuclear-armed nation. But I can't say that I disagree with him. Now, I don't want to get all tinfoil hat on you here, um, but when you look at Russia's problems in Ukraine from a kitchen counter point of view, right? There are some unique dynamics that are at play right now. So first of all, Putin does have the capability for tactical nuclear strikes, both in Ukraine and around the world. Not only that, but our intelligence community knows that Russia has been prepping for nuclear conflict for years, and not just with the production of missiles. I mean, in 2016, Russia suspended its armed reduction agreement with the United States. And in 2018, and true to nature, like they unveiled six new strategic weapons, including the RS-28 Sarmat, which is also commonly known as the Satan II missile, which is this super missile that allegedly is capable of wiping out areas as big as like Texas. Now, besides that, there are also reports that Russia has been deploying on average three new, um, I don't know how, how to pronounce it, but like Topol M- sixth generation ballistic missiles each and every month, three missiles a month. Now, the United States, on the other hand, we are continuing to disarm our nuclear stockpile, except for some funky numbers that were released over the last few years once the uh, the transparency was was built back in. The numbers are kind of weird. Like, it looks like we, like we increased 20 nuclear warheads in like 2020 or so. It's just, it's just been a... Um, it's kind of been up and down. And, and the numbers are kind of funky. Like I was saying, like they just kind of go up and down. They're not really sure if it's just taking warheads and, and maneuvering them out of one stockpile and into another. It's it's kind of funky. So, you know, I don't really necessarily know it's transparent. But let's look outside of just the missiles themselves. Residents of Moscow have been informed that there are enough bunker systems under the city for the entire population to live, including a metro network that interconnects many of these bunkers. So there's also means to be able to resupply there, but these, their metros have blast doors on them, especially like where you're talking about like down, downtown Moscow. So people have been, re, they've been reassured that, hey, if there's a, ever a nuclear holocaust here, like we've got you covered. They're building cities, complete cities underground. Why would you do that? Why would you, especially when you are, in not necessarily in the best economic economic position to be able to build underground cities. Why would you do that? Because they see the long road here. And on a personality level alone, Putin has recently compared himself to Russia's first emperor, Peter the Great, and compared his actions in Ukraine, Putin's actions in Ukraine, with the czar who waged war against Sweden for similar reasons that Putin is going into Ukraine. I mean, he's Putin just annexed a bunch of land there, just basically went in there, took it over and said, nope, now you're part of Russia and will be forever. 
Well, I'm not a history buff, but Peter the Great did the same thing with Sweden. He was basically trying to annex land back that he thought should be theirs. So if you want to be remembered in history as having like that superhero status of an emperor and you want to take on Western globalization yourself, you damn well better win that freaking war, right? Either that or there better be a, like a negotiated peace treaty where you get the lion's share of concessions. So how likely is there to be a peace treaty now that Ukraine has taken action on Putin's worst fears and he's applied for NATO membership and essentially ruled out any talks of peace with Putin? The question is, how far will Putin go to win the conflict if there's no negotiated peace treaty on the table and the rest of the world is watching him get his ass kicked? And if he does bring in nuclear weapons into that fight in Ukraine, will we retaliate with our own nuclear strikes? And if we do, who is going to then launch the next military strike? When we are weakened, when, I mean, we've seen this, whenever our efforts are, are being diverted somewhere else, whenever we are looking away or whether, whether uh, whenever we are like our efforts, our, our military power, whatever we have, right, is directed to one location. It makes us vulnerable in other areas. And so will other operators out there, will North Korea, definitely headed up by, by a crazy guy, right? Will he actually launch a missile? Will he attack one of our allies at the same time? Are, if somebody can try to pull us into something, we don't, we're not in control of everything that happens out there in the world. So is there a nuclear strike that's going to happen? Will we get pulled into a nuclear war? Will this be World War III? Your guess is as good as mine, right? I don't have a crystal ball. You don't either. I don't know what's going to unfold in the future. I'll hell, I'll admit that I thought this conflict in Ukraine was going to be over very quickly with Putin winning in some fashion. And he may still, right? We don't know how things are going to actually turn out. And there may be a negotiated peace treaty. That would be his best out, I think, for being able to save some face, but then also leave with some assurances that he's not going to have our nuclear weapons right at his doorstep because we're now, you know, taking care of a nuclear, um, of, a, of a NATO ally there. All right. So now let's bring it back home. So just how vulnerable are you and I in experiencing this nuclear Armageddon that Biden talks about? Well, if you truly want to call yourself prepared, you can't discount it, right? So the question is, what do you do about it? So the first thing I tell people do is let's start off with a reality check because the media can take hold of this and turn it into a whole bunch of different things out there and just raise up all of the, all of the, uh, the fury, all of the, the, the anxiety, all the stress about it. <coughs> Excuse me. And we have in our warrior life instructor network, people who are a lot smarter than me when it comes to this sort of stuff and the realities and prepping for a nuclear disaster or a nuclear attack. If you want, I would suggest going back and listening to my podcast interviews with uh, Joel Skousen, uh, an incredible, uh, incredible expert out there, especially on the topic of nuclear war, but also on strategic location. He has a book out there, um, Strategic Relocation. If you're watching on the uh, on the live stream, got the book right here, uh, an amazing resource right there. So I've done a couple of episodes with him, uh, episode 11 and number 75. I'd recommend going and listening to those are really good. Lots of good stuff in there. And then FJ Bohan uh, interviewed him in episode number 16 on a very important topic that we'll talk about here in this podcast as well. Um, but here's the silver bullet highlight reel with some of the realities that we did talk about in those different podcasts. A nuclear blast sucks. If you're within five miles, it is not going to be a good day for you, number one. Number two, a bigger threat is going to be what happens to people that are affected by the after effects of any kind of an attack in the way of being a danger to you and your family because of reduced resources. And number three, a nuclear incident is not that Mad Max wasteland trigger that the movies have made it out to be. Other than the blast itself, the other challenge is going to be nuclear fallout. Now, that's the stuff that movies are made of. And you probably have like these pictures of like, like one-eyed mutant pig people that are driving around in, in monster trucks with spike wheel caps. Actually, nuclear fallout 
only lasts for about two to three weeks. And it's absolutely survivable with the right preparation. Now, because this topic is on everyone's mind right now, we're going to go ahead and make our nuclear survival guide available for free inside of our Loot Locker section of the Warrior Life Academy. So if you are a Loot Locker member, all you have to do is just go inside of there. You'll see that we've just now added that to the resources there. This is something that we had for, for sale a long time ago. We don't have any pages up for it anymore where people can buy it, but it was an extensive manual with lots of great plans in there and preps and different things that you can do specific to a nuclear blast. So if you are a Loot Locker member, you can just go ahead and go inside of there. You'll find it now as a resource in the Loot Locker section. If you are not a Loot Locker member yet, um, you can go to warriorlife.com slash loot and sign up for free to grab that. Plus, there's a whole bunch of other resources in there as well. It's not going to cost you a thing. Just go to warriorlife.com slash loot and just get signed up, all right? All right, so to get things started, I'm going to go ahead and cover some of the main points and things that you can do right now to work on a game plan for alleviating any concerns that you may have about dealing with a nuclear disaster or an attack. And as always, it mostly comes down to getting the basics of your survival plan taken care of, namely looking at your plans for shelter, food, water. We're also going to cover some medical measures as well here. There are other areas that are part of a full survival plan as well, like, like communications and security. So we might lightly touch on those as well, but there's actually one more area that very few people ever think about as a survival measure, even those who consider themselves more experienced out there in survivalism. So I'll cover what that is and how to prepare for it here in just a minute. But first, let's go ahead and take a look at planning out your shelter. So the first step is to know your personal threat zone. Now, are you in a high threat area for a nuclear strike? Now, there are over 238 identified U.S. targets around the country, and you may not even realize that you're living near one of them. Joel Skousen's book, Strategic Relocation, this thing is a great resource for analyzing your area for any threat factors. Um, there's, it, It's not just for nuclear, but it, Joel goes into a lot of great, like he has a, he has a grading scale that he goes into, and he takes a look at the whole country, like you're in there. You're inside of that book, and it'll show you not only where you, like what your threats might be in your area, but it's also going to give you a really good game plan for where you might want to go if you do have to evacuate, if you are looking to relocate to someplace that is safer, this book is going to be a huge resource for you. I mean, it's just, I think everybody should just have it. But Joel uses a three-tiered approach for his strategic relocation and how especially he looks at the nuclear situation when it comes to um, your survivability. So first here is, are you living in a blast area? And a blast area is at maximum about five miles in a circular radius from any one of the targets that are identified in there. Now, that may not be taking into account possible weapons that could be used that would have a larger blast area than that, but we're looking at generally about a five mile radius around any of these targets. And those targets are located inside of strategic relocation there in there. Okay. So if you live in an unsafe area that's within that blast radius, you may want to think about relocating to live somewhere that's safer outside of the blast radius. Okay. All right. The second tier is um, kind of sheltering in place. So if you're outside of a target area, all you may need to do is take care of fallout protection, not blast protection. You don't have to really necessarily worry about it. So bugging out may be the best option to be able to get out of that area, but charting off into the unknown of where the next attack may hit isn't a great option also, because you might know the threat area where you live, but do you know what it's like in other areas around you where you might be going? The book has it in there, like it also help you plot out maybe your, your path, your, 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 your navigation to where is going to be a safer place for you. So you can use it for that as well. Personally, I would rather be at home. If I know I'm in an area where I can uh, survive the fallout, knowing what I know, then I'd probably rather be at home where I can prepare for waiting out the effects of that. So again, you've got to take care of all these other things here, right? Um, and then the third tier here is, is survival retreat location. Now, this can even be like a friend's place in a safe zone. So I'm, I always like to like meet people where you're at right now so that you don't have to go off into like doomsday bunker zone, right? Which we'll talk about too. But nonetheless, like if 
if all of this seems daunting to you, sometimes all it is just recognizing where are the safer places out there and who do you know in these areas or even reverse engineering it from the standpoint of what friends do you live that are within a, a enough of a, an area that you can get there in a day or so. We always recommend about 150 miles out from where you live, uh, looking at that at that zone because you can typically get there on uh, the gas that you might have in your vehicle or if you need to use alternative transportation, that's gonna that's about what we look at when it comes to planning, about 150 uh, miles outside of wherever you're at right now, all right? So you might wanna look at who lives in that area and then start to look at, okay, are they in a safe zone? So you can just look at where you would go to a friend's or a family member's or something like that, all right? So that's the third tier there. Now I do, again, get Joel's book, um, I think joelskousen.com, it's S-K-O-U-S-E-N, if I get that right, is where you can probably pick up, you can pick up that book. He has a bunch of other books there too. I also talked with him about building a shelter inside of your home, and we built that into our nuclear survival guide. So a lot of things we talk about here, you're going to get some plans inside of there that are going to help you get started with it all. Um, but I'm going to assume that, that most of you are not going to be moving out of your home just because you've suddenly realized that you're in a nuclear blast zone. So if you're not moving, you need to you need to really think about how you would respond to a nuclear attack, even the blast. So when it comes to the blast, again, you might be outside of that five mile zone, but you could also feel even like on the fringes of that five miles, it's not like you're going to get vaporized and there's just a five mile wall there. You need to know what to do if you do suddenly see a mushroom cloud go up or you see some sort of a, a major blast happen, you need to know what to do. So for that, I'm going to pop into another resource, which is our five-minute survival guide. So if you have not picked up the uh, the five-minute survival guide or if you're not sure what it is, if you're just tuning in, we just released this book on Amazon. It hit number one on the bestseller list. And essentially, it is not a, I mean, it gives you some some strategies for how to prepare for every single type of like disaster, collapse, attack, things like that. But it's really designed to be your instant action guide. I talk about this a lot, like in our masterclass, about the need to take fast, decisive action as quickly as possible, that those first five minutes really matter. It's kind of the 80-20 principle. Like 80% of your survivability is oftentimes going to come down to what you do in those first five minutes. And so created the five-minute survival guide so that people knew what to do in those first five minutes for any one of these attacks. So I'll use this as an example. I'll use the, it's all, it's all alphabetized. So I'm not going to read the whole, it's like two pages for each one of these, but I'm just going to read like an, an excerpt for if you see a blast. So if the blast is visible, uh, no matter how far away it's viewed, immediately seek shelter from the shock wave or lay on your stomach with your feet toward the blast, hands over your face. Beware of debris that can become dangerous projectiles. Indoors, brace yourself in a structurally sound location like a doorway. Number two, when safe, shut down any unfiltered ventilation to your home, such as air conditioners and heating systems that can pull in radioactive fallout. Close water supply lines until you can assess the contamination risk. Number three, take a shower to wash off radioactive dust and dirt. If you notice any, that's going to be in the area there because you've not sealed everything off. Seek or administer medical uh, attention if needed. And then number four, remain indoors to avoid exposure to radioactive fallout and monitor the emergency broadcast system for unofficial updates. I'm sorry, for official updates. Assess post-attack conditions to determine whether you should evacuate or continue to shelter in place. Now, that's only like the the first the things that you do in the first five minutes. There's also some additional stuff in here about suggested supplies and preps and then what to expect that comes after those first five minutes so that you can prepare for those. Now, again, you can go on to Amazon. Actually, what I recommend that you do because we have some uh, some bonus, some free bonus videos that go with this to give you even more details. You can go over to five minute survival.com and you can grab a copy there. There's a button there where you can get it on Amazon and then you just put your order number into the form that's there and then you'll get access to, uh, we're still keeping it up there for now, the free survival videos that you can, uh, there's some courses in there that aren't available anywhere else. Um, by the way, we have kept the price down on the five minute survival guide as low as Amazon would even let us list it. We're not looking to make any money off of this. I just want to get this out in everybody's hands. And then whatever money they force us to take, all of that goes into our nonprofit operation, save our soldiers to help veterans with, uh, with combat that are suffering from combat PTS. All right. Okay. 
So uh, that's that's one resource. So again, that's how you deal with the blast. And that's stuff that we learn in the military as well in our nuclear, biological, and chemical training that we have there. Okay. Again, that's the blast. and that's But that's not the threat that you'll most likely have to deal with. It's more of the fallout, the radioactive fallout that comes as a result of that blast. So let's move on to talking about your shelter considerations, like your actual shelter. Now, most people, when you talk about prepping a shelter against nuclear attack, they think bunker, right? In fact, bunker sales have skyrocketed in the past several years. And you can see old doomsday prepper shows from the History Channel that you know, people have these things being installed in their backyard where the pool was supposed to go. They got this big backhoe and all the neighbors are looking over the fence like, what's going on with Jim over there? Here's the silver bullet on bunkers. They are not all that they're cracked up to be. I mean, billionaires are building them at breakneck speed and they can do it the right way. They have the money to invest in it. But most of these doomsday prepper bunkers are a catastrophe waiting to happen. So if your location is known at all, I mean, how could it not be with that giant backhoe, like digging to the center of the earth in your backyard, right? Your neighbors are going to be demanding that you let them in if anything ever happens. And even if you do get inside unnoticed, within three days after a disaster, the locals are going to be out of food and other supplies. So what happens when your neighbors start using your ventilation system to try and smoke you out or they shove a garden hose in there? The best fallout shelters are located inside your house and integrated into it so you can get in and get out in secret. And it's really not that hard to build an in-home shelter, but you do need to understand the dynamics of it. Now, we cover this in depth in that nuclear survival guide that we've just made available to you for free inside of the Loot Locker section of our Warrior Life Academy. So again, go to warriorlife.com slash loot, and you'll be able to get free access there. And you'll get the plans as well for being able to build out some of the dynamics that we're talking about here. So let me give you an example of the dynamics that I am talking about. Now, remember, nuclear fallout particles are, are mainly what you need to protect from, right? So you can simply use dirt, sandbags, or plastic sheeting to seal off like a reinforced section of your home in order to keep the fallout out. It literally is like a dust. You just keep it out. But if you're sealed 100%, then you also have no ability to bring in oxygen and then you suffocate and die. But if you do bring in outside air, then you're gonna be bringing in radioactive fallout. So what do you do, right? Well, the answer is to be able to manufacture your own clean air. And this can really be done. It's really simple to do it. It's a do-it-yourself air system that uses a shop vac with a HEPA filter. Again, we have a blueprint for this inside of the nuclear survival guide in the loot locker section there. So, uh, so go check that out. We'll, we show you exactly how to put this together, all right? Okay, so now let's talk about your food situation. Now, this is where I highly recommend sl slowly stocking up on long-term survival food. If you can't afford to go all in and just get a bunch of this stuff, I would say just, just get it into your budget. These things are real, like they're so much better at being able to stash away um, its portability, its shelf, you know, usually a 25-year shelf life to them. Um, it's very portable. If you have to evacuate, you can take it with you as opposed to like canned goods and sacks of flour and things like that. Um, I highly recommend that you grab these, okay? Ready Hour is the company that we're currently using. Um, and we include in our in all of our XBOB uh, bug out bags, things like that. So um, I like them, but there's a lot of different food companies that are out there. But I also suggest that you include foods that are helpful in reducing the effects of any radiation that you may come into contact with. Now I'm talking about foods that are high in iodine and niacin. So an example of these foods are things like kelp, um, any sort of seaweed, spirulina, which is a blue-green algae, miso soup, which is like a fermented uh, fermented tofu, to fermented soy soup. You can get these instant out there. I recommend getting like the real kind, like from, a, from an Asian store. Iodized salt. There's iodine that is fortified in, in regular table salt, but not all salt is iodized. So Himalayan pink salt is not the same thing. You're looking for iodized salt. Also brown rice, and uh, which is high in niacin, and peanut butter, actually, which is super high in niacin. Very, very good. All you have to do is just go ahead and grab some of those things. In fact, um, if you have a Costco membership, I get these seaweed packets. They're dried seaweed. These things are delicious. You can use them as snacks. But I take all these things and I put them inside of the food kits where I put my survival food, my long-term survival food. It's all inside of portable kits. 
and I add these other things to them as well. All right, now let's talk about water. So water supplies may become contaminated by the radioactive fallout that's out there. If you have a if you have like a well, if you have your own well where you're getting drinking water from, um, the groundwater should be okay for at least the short term because it's really the exposure to that dust that you're that you're essentially worried about. Now, again, if you're not sealing off your home, if you don't have the ability to keep yourself sheltered with where things aren't coming, where that dust is not coming into your home, then you're in a better situation, especially if you have a thing like a well. Um, if you're not doing that, then you can just consider that there's going to be dust everywhere anyway, and then you're going to have a hard time. I mean, you basically, wherever that dust is, that's the radioactive fallout. You may not even see it, but you've got to keep that out. Um, however, you can't, you can't boil radiation out of water. So any other found sources is not really going to work all that well for you. So this is where stored water really can come in handy. Um, and it should be good as long as it is well sealed. So anything that you have that is bottled or canned or anything like that, as long as it's sealed off well, then you shouldn't have any problems with it. You can even store water. Um, you can get like the five gallon jugs. Those are great for storing water. You can get the the disposable, or like the one-time use water bottles. Um, you can even get something like a water brick and fill those up. Those are great for, for storing water long-term as well. They stack up really easily. There's, they're very easy to carry with you. I like those better than I like the five gallon jugs. But the key is, is like, the holy grail is always to be able to manufacture your own clean water. Now, the best process for this combines three different processes. It uses activated carbon as a filter, then it uses reverse osmosis, and then an ion exchange to be able to pull those radioactive materials out of there. Now, that's that's a that's a big program to try and put together. Um, reverse osmosis works to a certain extent. It removes about 70% of the, uh, of the radioact radioactive material. So if you do have a reverse osmosis system in your house and these can be installed in your in your sink just for just ha for having better quality water um, you can do that but again what we're really looking for unless it's an extended attack situation you're really looking to be able to survive about two to three weeks where you can just hunker down and be able to wait things out you've got good air that you've you've got there and then your stored water being able to uh, uh create your own water is going to be a big benefit for you there too okay <clears throat> there are some filters that claim to have room um be able to remove radioactive contaminants. I don't, I don't know what this is like at scale, so I can't really speak to it. If anybody out there really knows, um, I'd love to get your feedback on it. You can go ahead and leave a comment on our blog. I'd love to, I'd love to know more about that. I know that there are some advancements in water filters that can help with this, but um, I'm looking for real information, not just like marketing material. Okay. All right. So now let's talk about some of the mark uh, medical considerations. So one of the big prepper items out there that the doomsdayers love is potassium iodide tablets. Now you can get these, you can just get them off of Amazon. Essentially what they are is they're, they're made of a salt of stable iodine in medicine form, essentially. And what it does, it, it protects your thyroid gland from radioactive iodine from nuclear detonation, because that's what it does. It loads you up with this other type of, um, with a radioactive iodine in your body. And it collects in your thyroid and it can cause blood disorders, it can cause cancer, it can cause leukemia. So what the potassium iodide tablets do is they load up the thyroid with a stable form of iodine because your thyroid can't tell the difference between stable and radioactive unstable. So what it does is it loads up your thyroid um, with this stable form of iodine so that the thyroid doesn't have enough room to absorb the radioactive iodine. But there are limitations to this when it comes to the potassium iodide tablets because you can, you can essentially overdose on iodine. So you want to make sure that you really follow like the dosage on there, um, especially for children. I mean, you don't you definitely don't want kids to get their hands on this. Um, it should only be taken, I would say, if there is like a public health concern and public health officials state that you should. And by that time, I would think that there's probably going to be some element of being able to disseminate that. Now, would you go outside of your house to be able to do that? We're not going to talk about it here, but you can look inside of the nuclear survival guide that um, we're offering, and that does give you some, some ways that you can protect yourself if you do go outside of your home. So if you're able to get to some place that they're giving that, now you can get this stuff, like I said, on Amazon. So it's not that bad to be able to grab some of it, but it is not a preventative. So it's not like you're going to take it and it's going to stay in there and then you're going to be good to go. Like it's really only meant to be used when you really are in 
like when that threat is right outside your door there. Okay. So, so don't take it as a preventative right now. Um, okay. Uh, one other thing on this topic, like kind of from a medical perspective is um, inside of the nuclear survival guide, we have a, a do it yourself recipe for a radiation detox. And this is something I believe I got from, um, from my friends, uh, Dr. Bones and nurse Amy, who are kind of, they are the, like they're the experts when it comes to any sort of um, do-it-yourself medicine for survival purposes. And essentially this is like a radiation detox that you can put together. And this is really from supplements that you can find or, or foods that you can find also. And essentially what it comes down to, there's only three, well, three basic parts to it. So one is to take a thousand grams of NAC, otherwise known, well, I mean, NAC is the abbreviation for it. So it's N-acetylcysteine. It's a supplement. You can find this at any, you know, any supplement place like uh, GNC or uh, you can get it online. You can get, you can even get it in bulk. You take a thousand grams uh, twice a day. You also want to take five grams of either like spirulina or you want something that's going to be a little bit higher in, in iodine. So the NAC is going to give you, um, some element of this, right? So it's, and, and then if you're eating foods that are higher in iodine and niacin, that's going to do really well for you also. So five grams of spirulina will help you out. Um, uh, so that's going to, that's going to help you out right there. And then the, that third element is to add in these foods that we talked about before, like sea vegetables, like kelp and seaweed, um, miso soup, uh, also things like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, those are going to be uh, really good for you as well. You don't see those as often in survival food, don't you? Uh, here's your survival Brussels sprouts. Probably not the best, uh, the best selling survival food that's out there. Um, but anyway, those three things are, are really going to help you to, uh, to help with any sort of radioactive contaminants that you may be getting exposed to, but not necessarily know about it. Okay. Now, as I said, there are actually a lot more things that you can do to prepare for a nuclear threat, but it's way too much for me to go into in just one podcast. So again, all you have to do is just go on over. You can sign up for free um, for the loot lockers, go to warlife.com slash loot, go grab the nuclear survival guide. Uh, we put a lot of effort into this. We combined a lot of the information from experts that we've been working with out there. We added in um, a bunch of plans in there as well, blueprints that you can use to be able to take care of things very easily. No tinfoil hat needed there. Um, it has drawn out plans in there for things like your home nuclear bunker, as well as the emergency air system. Um, so definitely go and grab that. Um, it also it also covers some of the other food considerations as well, because I think that's the easiest thing for people to really kind of grasp onto. And, and it really does go a long way. All right. So go check it out there. And now it's time to hear from you. All right. So what other preps have you found to work for a nuclear disaster or an attack? All you have to do is just go ahead and leave a comment on our blog, wherever you see this episode, you can just go on over to warriorlife.com slash podcast. That'll take you over to a special section there where we have all of our podcasts listed there. Also, if you want to grab the one-page cheat sheet, that is also inside of the Loot Locker. So we'll put that in there as well. You'll see that all the cheat sheets are in there from most of our past episodes. We're trying to get caught up now, but with all the rebranding, it's still going to have some of our old branding on it. Uh, but we are trying to go back and, and get some of those done as well. But you will see the the cheat sheet for this episode. It's all one page. You can just print those things out, put them into a binder, and make a really great resource for you on a whole bunch of different topics, right? Okay, so that's it. I'd love to hear from you. Go ahead and leave a comment for us. I, wherever you're watching, if you're on YouTube watching the stream, please go ahead and leave a comment where you are watching this now. I'd love to hear from you there. Instagram, we're also streaming there, as well as on the Facebooks and of course, over at our, our blog and our website, you can find the audio ep episode of this as well. All right. And until our next broadcast, this is Jeff Anderson saying prepare, train and survive.